I'm Jeff Gallant. I, as mentioned, I'm the Program Director of Affordable Learning Georgia. Um, I am presenting today from Lawrenceville, Georgia, which is Creek Nation, uh, now part of the larger Muscogee Nation land. Uh, so I am immediately going to jump into a chat question, and I really do want your input, even if this is your first day ever working with OER. In your work, whatever that work is, what's the most impactful thing that you have done uh, for a faculty member, a student, a staff member, anyone at your institution? What was the thing that you did that made the most impact? I have an entire phone to read chat here, so I can... Uh, see all of that come in. Okay, uh, Clement says, probably encourage some of my students to pursue it, uh, to pursue higher education. Wow. Um, get a statewide conversation started. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Stephanie, that was Certainly amazing work. Um, Hillary says, uh, set up a grant for faculty to adopt OER. Uh, Simon says, helping faculty members shepherd their OER projects along to completion is a very rewarding feeling. Uh, Marty created a visual literacy survey to test visual analysis skills and use that to create her own OER. Uh, Jennifer says, began working with the Inside Out Prison Program and been able to source OER for the students. Uh, Jojo, oh, hey, how's it going? Uh, says, I help students and faculty feel that the tools are not above them. Uh, Elizabeth, working with Lewis on a statewide grant to be able to create open middle course shells for dual enrollment students. Wow, cool. Uh, that's some uh, SREB symmetry, too. Uh, Sabrina, helping student government write an OER resolution. Those must have been really cool meetings, uh, meeting with students and talking about their experiences and why uh, it's so important. Uh, keep them coming. I will keep going in the interest of time. Uh, I'm going to put a couple of quotes up here about impactful things that people have done, and they're of different scale. The first one is from um, Dr. Herman Vargas, who was uh, one of our champions at the College of Coastal Georgia. He has moved on to bigger and bigger academic positions and now has no time to do anything. But when he started, um, he was a mathematics professor, and he would go door to door to other faculty members in other places, people he didn't even know, uh, talking to them about textbooks, showing them a print open stacks textbook, uh, going to the anatomy and physiology folks. And he said, you know, he's, he's kind of like a sales rep, but he's getting 15% commission on zero dollars, which is what it will cost their students if they uh, switch over. So going from place to place and, and talking to folks. Uh, the Open Education Conference, uh, which I'm sure you are very familiar with, right in the mission statement says that it strives to build trust, foster relationships, strengthen skills, cultivate open and inclusive practices, and support others in championing open education. This is a lot of community building here. This is large scale connections going on. Um, here's one that's very old school uh, from David Wiley when him and Stephen Downs would go back and forth. I think they still do on their blogs. Really a, a different time. Um, but he said here, even though I can't understand what he's been saying to me for the last year, uh, he still pushes me around mentally. It makes me think and write. You have to love someone who does that for you. Uh, so having, in some ways, a combative conversation, but it's something that allows more ideas to emerge, which is really cool. It's it, even though you think that something like posting an argumentative blog article would be uh, less impactful practice, it, it did make a difference. And this is what I'm trying to get at today is that the whole foundation of open education is connections. Um, so a lot of these that I'm hearing in here have to do with some sort of connection or support. Uh, someone reached out and said, you know, OER is not as tough as it looks and it's really going to help you. Um, you know, if you're connecting with people at a workshop, if you're running a grant program, you have a great, uh, you have a great venue to make connections with new faculty members. Uh, if you're working with a consortium, suddenly you're getting to know all the leaders there, they're getting to know you, you're getting ideas back and forth, they're learning from you, you're learning from them. 
uh, providing materials, providing resources, uh, staff time to support OER, as many of you have already suggested. And these are all different kinds of connections, but they're all very impactful. They're things that let open education emerge and let it happen. And yeah, it's all about connections and conversation, and that's pretty cool. So I'm gonna ask you a second question, which may or may not be a little unnerving. You just arrived at a party with over 200 people in the room. You haven't met most of them. You don't know any of them. What do you want to do? Share that in the chat and be as honest as possible. I will share mine. Run and hide. There we go. Leave, hide, find the pet. That's a good one. If there is a, a dog or a cat, uh, yeah, that's that's the best. By the way, if you hear uh, some barking, that is my uh, extremely cute guard dog, Rocket. Uh, she's not really a guard dog, but she thinks she is. Um, yep, <laughs> Jennifer says yes, hi to Rocket. Talk a lot. Okay, so Elizabeth is all about talking to folks. That's great. Uh, find one person who seems friendly. Just talk with them for a while. That's a great way to, to go about it. And you're going to see that there, there are different kinds of answers here. Yes, I'm going to say hide. And you might think that the typical librarian response might be that. Um, but Marty says, find a conversation I can join. Some folks love this. This is their thing, their strength. So uh, connecting is not my strength, as you probably saw in the chat. Uh, and I'm going to post a, a couple of personality flaws up, uh, personality tests up here. They are flawed. They are all self-reported. But it's one of those things where you see a trend after a while. Uh, low extroversion, INTJ, little to no influence, uh, zero influence strengths, minuscule social score in uh, emergenetics. Um, I self-tested myself as an Enneagram 1, but when I worked with an organizational developer, she diagnosed me as an Enneagram 5. I read the description and went, oh, yep, mm -hmm, that, that one's me. Uh, so, yeah, I tend to keep to myself if I have no, if I have all my options open. And, yeah, <laughs> a bit of a reserved data nerd. Ah, fellow INTJ. Hi, Sabrina. Um, if it's not a natural thing for you to make social connections like it is for me. And it's it's been tough. I know that these make a huge impact, that there's, there's something to it. There's something that's missing when I am not socializing with folks uh, who are involved in open education or who are involved in our institutions in general. And I need to think more systematically about things if I'm going to be more comfortable. And I hope that this will help you out here today if you're one of those folks. Uh, so what I'm going to do is take a little bit of a theoretical detour. Because this is what happened. The pandemic came in and we just lost a lot of opportunities to socialize in person. And some of those, uh, I think some of the attributes that are missing are things that we just took for granted when we were in person. I'm not saying let's go out in public immediately and you know disregard the many public health issues that are going on today. But what I want to do is start working from a base theoretical perspective and then go from there. So we have an institution or we have a system if you're working for say Lewis or Affordable Learning Georgia is part of the USG, which is the university system of Georgia. Um, these are networks of people and of other things, of resources, of software, all of that. So the first thing that you might logically want to do is look at social network theory. Now this is not the theory of Facebook, although these types of of applications facilitate social networks. Social networks are groups usually of people and they are connected together. Uh, so when you're analyzing them, you say that these are nodes, these little points in place to place, connected with uh, basically lines, the sets of what they would call ties, or they sometimes call them edges that link them together. Now, Social network theorists would say that nodes are unique and ties have various features. They are sometimes strong, they're sometimes weak. Um, if you look at a diagram of a social network, you can see a couple of different trends here. Um, 
one of them is you can see a centralized network. And at that point, you would say that the node in the middle probably has more social power as it is distributing things outwards towards uh, everyone else and everyone else is bringing it in towards that centralized node. Um, a decentralized one would be a different kind of thing. Some are dense, some aren't. Uh, some will have different attributes and some will have different kinds of ties together. Now, if you're analyzing a social network, a, a social network analyst, someone who is into the science of this stuff, would say that you know there's a, an infinite amount of variety uh, with nodes and ties. And so you have to analyze the entire network if you don't, if you just take a sample, uh, you won't get what the network's all about. And you could imagine if you saw like part of a big dense social network map and there's like a bunch of lines over here, a bunch of lines over here, and you just take this one square, it's not gonna make any sense. Um, but you can't really do that without some sort of closed platform that diagrams all of this together. And when you're looking at social network theory, um, you're, you're often looking at nodes in particular, individual ones that uh, create some sort of focus. So for example, if you're looking at a social network diagram of an election, uh, if you're seeing the different candidates, who are they connected to, uh, who's the most connected, who's connected to very powerful people, that type of thing. Uh, Social network analysis can get into that, but they, they tend to look uh, ultimately at the individual level. They're looking at a node and saying, well, how does this node here influence stuff? Um, and you, you might wanna also look at social psychology, right? So here's the whole social network thing. Social psychology talks about how that influence works in social situations. So you're in this big network, how can you, change someone else's thoughts in a society and how does that society come back to you and change your thoughts feelings and behaviors um it it is kind of an interesting look but again i've looked at this and i looked at social psychology and i thought this isn't quite what i'm looking for this is not getting quite at what we're missing over in open education and part of it is a complexity issue so it's not necessarily that social network theorists or social network scientists that those people are focusing too much on social capital and individualism. It's more that the applications of it wind up that way, of looking at oh, who has clout, who has influence, right? Um, it's all about who you know. Those aren't the takeaways that I'm looking for when I'm trying to get at how does socialization help in open education and what do we need to do in order to improve that in in a virtual world or a hybrid world or once we come back to in person if if that happens i i hope i hope at some point it does um how is it that we can use socialization as a, a part of this as a part of our community as something that builds up open education so think of the closest group that you work with. Um, that's you know a department, your institution, system, state, et cetera. Um, describe that whole group in one sentence. Give me the attributes to it. How does it behave? Go. You don't have to mention the name, but it, just put that in chat. Energetic, fun, creative, engaged and supportive, tight knit group of collaborators. Wow, you you guys are working on some great teams. Not afraid to take risks. Now this might have stumped you, right? Because there are some good attributes that you could probably look at if you have a, a small group um, or if you're looking at it in general and saying, well, most of us are on this. Uh, I read one sentence as one word. That's even harder. Um, so if you were to describe that 
whole group in one sentence, you might be thinking, well, okay, well, sometimes I come to, come into work very tired and I may not be as energetic as I am describing here. Or you've got a 200 person organization, you don't know everybody in there, but that guy at the desk over there, sometimes he's a little tired, I don't know. Um, you know, so you might be describing something, but you can't really reduce it to everybody at all times, especially if, as you get bigger. Oh, we see a welcoming group. That's excellent. So uniqueness is kind of tough when you're looking at social network theory. When you're applying it, as opposed to somebody who's talking about it, um, you tend to reduce nodes to the larger group. You just kind of look at, well, who's the most connected? Who's got the most influence, that kind of thing. And you can't really do that when you're looking at your institution or your group, when you're trying to get the word out about OER, um, if you're even just talking about librarians, right? I made a statement a little bit earlier about, well, maybe that's the typical librarian response of running and hiding during the party. But there are social librarians out there, right? Um, instructional designers are all unique. IT specialists uh, from the ones who are creating for-profit commercial platforms uh, to the open source people who are doing it as a labor of love. They're, everyone is unique. And that's not just the people who are involved in that network. Uh, funds are involved. So you might have all of the OER knowledge in the world and zero time to do it, zero resources to do it. Uh, you might be in a great team that's very devoted and dedicated, and you have to go into an office building with no HVAC and it's 90 degrees in there. That might be really tough. So even buildings are part of this. Uh, your location, how the climate's doing. If you're looking at Europe right now, the climate is not going so well. Uh, it's there, there are a lot of fires and stuff up there, and that affects work. That affects how your group functions. All of your uh, shared experiences, um, if you're in a different race, ethnicity, your experiences are different. Your thoughts about things might be different. And all of these matter. They all intersect. So we're going into a different kind of theory here, which is called assemblage theory. Uh, this is championed especially and expanded by Manuel de Landa. He is a Mexican-American sociologist. He uh, is at the New School in New York. Um, he worked on some uh, other folks' previous observations about how groups function and took them forward quite a bit. And he even takes things like history and science into account. We're not going to go too far into that today, again, in the interest of time. But I think this is a good foundation for why socialization matters and why connections matter so much in open ed. So an assemblage is a group of people, of things, of locations, of anything that's part of a group that's linked by a reason outside of each part's entire identity. Uh, so it's people are not there by default. They are in a group because of something, whether that's their location, uh, whether that's their involvement in open ed. And so that external linkage, that thing that brings people in, that's called exteriority. That means that this group has a reason to be together beyond their group, they're together. And a big part of assemblages is that every single part is unique, uh, whether that's the, the resources being given, whether that is uh, a faculty member in a department, um, a librarian who's running things, uh, an open education administrator, all of them have very unique attributes. They are different kinds of parts in these groups. So knowing only about those two things, that you can't reduce any part of an assemblage to the whole, and that everybody needs to be brought together for a reason, please name any group in chat that you think is an assemblage.
I'm looking at chat at the moment. Okay, so chat threads uh, with your friends. Yeah, uh, a certain group that would be an assemblage because your friends that brought you together. Um, you can't say that your group of friends is always this or always that. Mm -hmm. Professional committees, right. So that's a lot of what what they, what he would call exteriority, right? Uh, it it is a lot of being brought together to do a particular thing, a faculty senate, yeah. And if you've ever been in a faculty senate or presented to a faculty senate, you know you cannot reduce uh, any of the faculty senate members to the whole of the faculty senate. You wouldn't be like, well, the faculty senate always does this. Every single person wants to have their voice heard because they are uh, in many different ways unique. I'm going to keep going, but just keep this in mind as we're going on. Um, a couple of other aspects of assemblages, and, and I am going somewhere with this, and you'll see uh, why soon enough. Uh, nothing is set in stone. Any properties of an assemblage are what they would say is contingent, right? It, they depend on interactions happening. If those interactions do not happen regularly, then that group, that assemblage may not ever exist. Even if this is based on a building, if you never go to that building, well, is the building really bringing you together in the first place, right? Um, but especially if you're just not talking to someone, are you in conversation with them? Are you connected with them? Uh, if those conversations stop. Now, assemblages cause themselves. And because they cause themselves, these interactions are super important. The assemblage itself may not uh, in practice exist uh, if you wind up in a place where interactions just aren't happening. Uh, these things don't exist on their own. They don't, they don't just boom, they're there. Uh, they only exist because interactions happen. Uh, so that's why we say they're not transcendent. And they overlap. So it's not just that you're on a task force and that is the only group that you are in, right? You might be a member of your family. Well, of course you are. Uh, you might be a friend in your group of friends. Uh, you could be part of a uh, volunteer organization, part of a church. You could be uh, running your Dungeons and Dragons campaign. You could have won your fantasy football league three years ago or something like that. Uh, you could be the, the person that knows all about various chili peppers. You could be a death metal needlepoint artist in a group of death metal needlepoint artists. Uh, it, you, could, you could have a state meetup in Tennessee. All of these overlap. And so you're not just part of one assemblage at any point in time. You're part of a lot of them. Um, and I didn't just learn about this through different scholarly research and library searching. I knew this because there is a musician that I follow that was a huge fan of exactly this. Uh, yep, yeah. uh, Simon says it sounds like a fun group people hang out with. Uh, yeah. So where do assemblages wind up? Well, they wind up with emergence. So if you are a group that's made up of unique parts, you can't reduce them to the group. They're contingent on the different interactions that happen between them, between other groups. Um, the results are not going to be predictable. They're not going to be something that uh, one person had planned the whole time and said, this is what it's going to be. Um, results emerge from that. And because of that, if you are running things within an assemblage, you want to aim for emergence. And even though a lot of us have said in the past, like, well, we don't want to mandate things. If we do that, people won't like it. Everyone's unique. Um, that seems more like a practical thing. There's a theoretical foundation for this. Grants and, and support wind up 
fostering emergence. You might not know what comes out of an OER project until it's done. And then maybe down the line, suddenly it morphs and changes, which is really cool. And all of these things emerge. So a lot of old history stuff, uh, you'll hear a lot about a, a great person that caused this to happen. But was it really that person or was it the world around them, their groups, the stuff that interacts with them, the whole assemblage that uh, that contributed to this work? Um, do projects happen because individuals are free to choose whatever they want? Or do they happen because a structure imposes it on them? Uh, it, you know, it's kind of that free will uh, versus structure type of thing. Uh, and what assemblage theory says is both of them. And uh, you don't want an or here just saying it's only society or it's you. It's, it's definitely a combination of those things. Um, Affordable Learning Georgia, when we talk about our achievements, a lot of times people are like, oh, and it's, it's you know, it's a great organization. Well, it is, but also our faculty are amazing, and they are within 26 different institutions. Um, uh, the people who supported our initiative from the top were amazing at doing so. Uh, there are a whole bunch of different circumstances that allowed ALG to thrive, so you can't attribute it to absolutely not just me, but even just our initiative. And then networks, because every interaction is unique, you, you would want to think about connections not as just like a regular line that just kind of exists because it's there. It has different attributes to it. Um, it it's almost like they have different factors that are running at the same time between you and your, uh, your organization, between uh, your organization and the Open Education Network, the Open Education Southern Symposium, the Open Ed Conference. Uh, those interactions are varied and they are contingent on more interactions happening. So the last thing you need to know is that everything is an assemblage, according to Delanda. And if you think about that, nearly everything is. You can't even reduce all of humanity to the sum of humanity's group, right? Um, you couldn't reduce the earth to itself in, in different ways. If you looked at various pieces of land, you'd be like, yeah, but this is a lot different than what's over here. Um, if you go really big or if you go really small, you can see that everything has interactions that are based on, uh, like everything has interactions and the existence of those things is based on the interaction between each other. The, the whole uh, koan of a, if a tree falls in the forest, doesn't make a sound. It's all about those interactions. It, it's all about observation and interaction. And open education is an assemblage, right? Um, any symposium, any conference is contingent on the interactions between folks. The program committees, the organizers, um, everyone who's attending, everyone who's typing into the chat. If none of this happens, it's not what it should be, right? Uh, the Open Education Network is also contingent. Open Ed, Open uh, Education Group, the uh, research folks, all of that is contingent on interactions. Uh, it's not just that people are members of uh, the Open Education Network and that's it, things just get done. Um, it's because the OEN has folks who are reaching out. It's because people within the kind of decentralized larger group are talking with each other. Uh, that's why those things exist in the first place. The results emerge from within. Sometimes you get really surprising, cool things to share about, I can't believe this happened in the middle of open ed. Uh, that, that kind of stuff, that emergence is the whole point. And we work in assemblages. Uh, we always, talk about how uh, there are quality issues that faculty will have with particular open educational resources, right? And then that quality differs per faculty member. And for some, even though they might be saying, well, uh, high quality images are what's high quality to me, and someone in the humanities or might, might bristle at that, 
you would have an anatomy and physiology instructor who says, no, high quality images are extremely important for me to teach people what this particular body part looks like. Um, so quality will always have different meanings to different instructors, even within the same department. Someone may trust an author very well. Someone may trust a company or a publisher. Uh, they may have various types of thoughts about it because of all of the overlapping assemblages that they are a part of. Uh, so we often say in open education, we just want to make open ed 100% a thing we do. We want 100% adoption. We want everybody to be doing open education. That'd be really tough. Uh, even though you might see uh, commercial resources as a thing that institutions do right now, not everyone did that. Uh, not everyone has done that for years and years and years. So it's all about making sure that you have connections with folks and those connections are contingent because otherwise you, you can't just have a thing that we do that exists and just kind of runs itself. It's always contingent on interactions. And therefore your communications need to be persistent and they need to be impactful because any program, any group, any committee, they are all contingent. And it's more than just people. We're not just talking about networks of folks. We are also talking about networks of resources and of locations, uh, of support, of teamwork, of uh, acknowledgments, like with promotion and tenure. Uh, so, for example, the existence of open educational resources out there on the web, that helps with faculty's individual affordability um, endeavors because sometimes they need those. They need that time. They, they don't have the time to reinvent the wheel. Those are parts of the open ed assemblage. Uh, so are OER programs. I mean, if you have a great program with a bunch of people who are very organized and ready to go and they have no funding, there are some things that you can get done, but not everything. Uh, librarians often are given OER work without having it being put in their job descriptions. Um, that kind of support is part of the assemblage too. Uh, having OER work be included. Uh, so not just people, but various kinds of resources, of time, of support. Uh, we talk about OER labor a lot. Uh, and that is a big part of this, that, that it's not just about the people who are involved in open ed. It's about the resources that support those people. And grants definitely do target that end goal of emergence. Um, we can't exactly predict what we're going to get when we uh, have a grant out there. And sometimes things don't work out and it, it can be uh, a real sad story. We've had some uh, grant uh, projects that happened in Affordable Learning Georgia where not only did things not work out, but things personally went wrong, um, not between people in the team, but just, you know, family matters or just the fact that we are human. We've had uh, people pass away in the middle of one of our uh, grants and then the rest of the team had to find out what to do next. Uh, but on the other side of it, sometimes way more happens than what you thought. Our first ever round of grants, we thought these are for adoptions. People are gonna go out, find OER that exists and they are going to put it into their class and boom, that's it. They just needed to take the time to do that course redesign and that's final. But no, of course they started creating new resources. We'd have uh, sets of videos that people created to enhance the experience for students. Um, at the very least, you have lecture slides. Uh, you might have a, a location for all of the resources on a campus website or something like that. Like there were, even though we just planned on adoption, stuff emerged anyway. So these grants do create a connection of sorts. It's a monetary connection. It's a time connection. And the bigger the grant is, the more uh, deadlines and stuff like that might be associated with it, the more reports are going to be due. Those are kinds of connections, even though they're not conversations, right? But your champions are contingent too. And this is where I'm starting to get to the central point of this, uh, something that 
really hit home with me uh, in the past couple of years. If you don't have regular interactions and support with your champions and with your advocates, with the people who are spreading the word about OER on campus, those groups may as well not exist. As we're talking about contingency in an assemblage, this is what we're, we're really trying to hit home at here. Um, 2020 through 2022, we saw a whole bunch of not just decreased interactions, but turnover as well. Um, there were just a lot of folks who resigned, left for a different thing. Um, people who were retiring as the emergency shift happens to online instruction. Um, and then what happens? Are there new champions coming in? Are they, go are they going to be as connected um, as the folks with this older institutional knowledge and, and uh, you know, past interactions with each other? How do you make sure that your champions uh, will continue to exist in an assemblage kind of way? Uh, and this is one of the big reasons, a little sidebar here, that, that retention matters so much when it comes to keeping your faculty and your staff. You, those connections are super important. You can rebuild connections with new folks and that's great, but there's so much value, not only in the, the node in the social network that's there, right? But with the unique person that has those connections to, to other folks. So why this pre presentation exists in the first place? This, it has to do with our champions. We've met uh, online every month. We've done this since 2014. It's always the, uh, the first Thursday of the month. Sometimes it sneaks up on us because it's the first or the second of the month and we go, whoa, wait, there's a champions meeting. Uh, but yeah, it's always been uh, happening at that time. And it's a great way for us to at least share our announcements and what's changed and get some sort of input from uh, our champions at different institutions. So we have 26 different institutions over in our system and we hear from all of them. Uh, but when COVID-19 hit, we still met, but something was missing, especially as time went on. We lost those in-person opportunities. And even though those were pretty rare back in the day because travel budgets are what they are and we're a pretty big state, they still seemed important. There were things that we would do or that things that changed in our program or things that informed us uh, about where everything is at the moment that we learned in just kind of having dinner with folks or you know, just walking over at lunch and having a burger with uh, a couple of folks from a particular institution. Those big meetings weren't bringing about those kinds of interactions. And it is something where you might say, well, okay, that means that the in-person stuff is important, but I think it's more important to look at why. Like, why were those in-person meetings important in the first place? So yeah, nothing happens without conversations. Uh, when it comes to open education, if these conversations do not happen, then the open education community may as well not exist. Interactions need to continue and continue in order for cool emergent things to happen. And that happens everywhere. Uh, it could be within a larger open education network. It could be between faculty, between OER leaders and administration. Um, you know, a lot of us have seen big changes in uh, the folks up at top, presidents, chancellors. They're not going to maybe know about what OER is and we're going to have regular interactions to ensure that they do know this and that they know it's a priority. Uh, there's almost an, an infinity of unique reactions that are required to keep open education alive. And we can't just say, okay, well, let's ignore all the public health threats and go in person, right? We want to take a look at exactly why that was happening. Well, our big meetings were recorded. Our little in-person things, having a burger with folks, that wasn't recorded. They were smaller. Uh, you know, there were a couple of folks, you, you wouldn't be nervous to speak to a whole audience about how things are going. Um, they're personal, they're unique, they're focused more 
on the unique people in that room and the unique assemblages that they are a part of. Um, and it was focused on, yeah, just one institution. So a little bit more focused than you usually have in a big meeting. So now we're having institutional champions meetings. We're meeting online with just the champions from one institution. Uh, and that's once per year, but that's 26 new meetings. Now that's a lot of time, that's a lot of effort. And that involves some decision-making to say this is worth it. But if our stuff is, if open education itself is contingent on all of these interactions and because good emergent things don't happen without those interactions, it's super important that we have some regular interactions with our champions at each institution. And this might not seem like a big thing, but it's, it's a first application uh, over here of applying assemblage theory to what we do. And so I would be silly not to talk about this whole thing going from theory to practice and then not talk about results. We've only been doing this for about a half year, but there have been some emergent ideas and some changes that have come from them already. Um, there was one institution that talked about grant applicant confusion. When they were applying, they weren't sure if they were applying for the big transformation thing where you replace all of the uh, commercial resources in a course with OER, or a continuous improvement grant where you're um, looking at the stuff that you're already using, all the open stuff, and improving it through creating ancillary materials, through revisions, that type of thing. Um, because of that, uh, Tiffany, um, who uh, no longer works with us on July 1st, we miss her so much, she made a branching path tutorial to get people to exactly where they need to be on applying for either a transformation or a continuous improvement grant. And we integrate that right on the page for the call for proposals. So thank you, Tiffany, uh, if you're out there, um, maybe watching the recording or something like that. Thank you so much. Um, one institution mentioned a, uh, a poor implementation of a thing that helps people um, attach a no cost or low cost attribute to their section. Oh yeah, okay, well, we can get a link to that. I will do it right after. Um, yeah, and because of this, because we found out that the tool was not very well implemented, we're now checking with the makers of that tool to see if it's being used across our system. Um, there are a few different people who were talking about various organizational aspects of the ALG website and ones that we couldn't just make a quick change to. We had been thinking about an ALG website for a while, but these conversations solidified that we needed a new one. So we are working on the redesign now, it, as opposed to before where it was like, well, you know, everything is, is there, it's organized. We have these big buttons for the big things. So I think it should be okay. Now we're seeing some structural issues in these conversations that make us want to address them. So we are pushing it forward. Uh, we've unified all of our listserv groups into one newsletter to make sure that the announcements get to every single group. That also came from a trend of, well, my faculty got this one, but they didn't get this one. And I was like, oh, no. So we go back and check and see if the faculty member's there. And it's like, oh, well, they're not on this list, but they're on this list. By bringing them all together, that should help quite a bit. Um, so, yeah, just a few things that have already emerged from these conversations. And even though this this might seem like common sense, right? And it's it's that way with just about all of management theory. Uh, well, isn't that just being a good listener? Isn't that just talking all the time? And, and yeah, kind of, but everyone has different strengths and everyone has different focuses. And a lot of us are kind of isolated in the past few years. And we're not, we're all looking at what the heck we could do better, but there's not much to see. So looking through different types of theory can help you in making new decisions like this. If socialization isn't a strength of yours, taking a more systematic approach. Okay, we are going to meet with um, all of our institutions. It's about three people in each meeting every year. That winds up giving you a little bit of structure. It's not that 200 person party where, where like you just have to pick what you're going to do. You are meeting with people every so often. 
So we don't have much more time left, but the last thing I wanted to ask you, no matter what you do in open education, um, personally, what could you do to increase and strengthen interactions with your open ed folks? How could you make your conversations more impactful? I wanna hear that in the chat. <laughs> Traveling to an in-person event would be great. Ah, yep. Uh, Jojo says, come to their presentations and answer the questions in chat. Ah, yeah, I love doing that. Uh, Melissa says, "Things uh, think about ways to locate champions both locally and more regionally. Yeah, uh, just getting folks together, um, doing the initial work is, is a huge part of it. Doing some just because check-ins. Uh, Elizabeth has a really good idea there. Just how are you doing? Uh, sometimes the answer is just, ah, things are going fine. Not much happening. But then other times, Things emerge from those conversations. Emergence is that thing. Yeah, uh, Clement says, yeah, I could have asked to make interventions in other departments meetings. Ooh. <laughs> uh, collaborating with other institutions, yes. Uh, like the champion's idea, the Open Ed Network has a piece where you identify your OER heroes. Yeah. And what I found is that you can find them, but then you have to keep it going after that. So you can put more into the chat, but in the interest of time, um, I'm just gonna quickly close this out. So there are a few notes here. This is incomplete. I couldn't talk about assemblage theory in an hour. There's a lot to it. Um, and it, it's an all rights reserved text. I know it's it's not open, yeah. but um, my library had it as an ebook. I think it's uh, pretty well published as an ebook out there. So you may be able to find assemblage theory in in your collections. And there's way more to it than what I'm talking about today. It's incomplete. There's uh, a lot of interesting things about like what is an aspect of an assemblage or a group of any kind. Uh, that it doesn't cut across the entire group, but it's pretty common. What do you call that? And are there various levels of it? And there's that kind of stuff is really interesting, but not enough time today. Um, and even this big first solution that we're talking about today is flawed. Um, Tiffany uh, left ALG on July 1st to take care of her new family member, Sophia, full time. Uh, really, really cute baby amazing. Uh, so, uh, you know, we are uh, one person down at the moment, and we're going to have to restart all of this champion scheduling very, very soon. Um, policies on remote work will affect retention, and retention matters a lot because everything is contingent. Um, yeah, this is going to be a very difficult time for folks. So the people who are running a lot of open education programs are not the ones that are also creating these policies. It's, it's been a difficult time for that. So I'm just going to call on everyone to go forth and interact during the rest of this symposium. Um, I know that we are ending at uh, 1055 technically, and that is right now. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, let me know. I'm at jeff.galan at usg.edu. Um, our stuff is over at affordablelearninggeorgia.org. It is CC BY 4.0 licensed, so please do use it in any manner that you want. If you find something cool on there, repurpose it for sure. Um, on Twitter, I'm at Jeff W. Gallant. Um, the organization is at A Learning GA. That's more about um, the announcements than anything else. And yeah, uh, thanks so much to uh, Nikki Retch at uh, Georgia Southern for uh, cluing me into something called SlidesGo that helped with the design of this slideshow. Um, most of the stuff that is used on here are public domain vector images and public domain uh, designs, but a, uh, an attribution of it is still pretty cool to do. 
All right, thank you so much. I know that at 11 o'clock, we are going to get started with another presentation. So I am going to turn it over to everyone else. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, Jeff. That was awesome, as always. Um, thank you again for agreeing to be our keynote. Um, I am always, there are a couple of OER folks that I'm always energized and inspired by when I listen to them speak about OER. Um, Robin DeRosa, Rajiv Janjiani, Will Cross, and Jeff Gallant. So uh, 